is Totally 80s, the podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. So turn up your Walkman, loosen that scrunchie and get ready to talk 80s with your host, Lindsay Parker. Hi, I'm Lindsay Parker from Yahoo Entertainment and Sirius XM Volume, and this is another episode of Totally 80s. If this is the first time you're joining us, why not take a second to follow us at Totally 80s on Facebook and Instagram, or you can also email us your comments and show ideas to podcast at totally80s.com. And you can see our episodes on video as well on our Totally 80s YouTube channel, so check that out if you are so inclined. And joining me today, as always, is my partner in all things 80s, the Morrissey to my Mar, John <laughs> Hughes. Sorry, I want to be Johnny Mar. I claim dibs. You get to be Morrissey. I'm sorry. Can I be I'm Mike pro- Joyce and like take all the money? I mean, <laughs> let me. Mike do- Joyce, well, yeah, not Andy <laughs> Rourke. Poor, so poor Andy Rourke has gotten the short end of the stick that he was the first, first, fourth choice. But Apparently. no, I'm sorry. But Lindsay, stop me if you think that you've heard this one before. But we've got a great topic today. <laughs> How soon is now? Should we just start talking about it? Should we bring on our guest? Um, obviously, this intro, which, you know, I never met a good Smith's pun that I didn't like. Obviously, that should have been the tip off of what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about one of the most influential bands to come out of the 1980s. We're talking about the Smiths, of course. They broke new ground by actually bucking the synthesizers, unlike many of their post-punk peers of the era, relying on the classic three-piece rock combo format. And, of course, combining it with the witty and sometimes brutally honest lyrics of the still, to this day, brutally honest Morrissey. Incredibly, they were only together for about five years, and they only released five proper studio albums during their run. But they are still huge today with an insane superfan following worldwide. And joining us to discuss all things Smiths today and related to that fan base is the director of a new film inspired by his love of the band and the fandom surrounding the band. The film is titled Shoplifters of the World, and the director has made other acclaimed documentaries, actually, like Scott Walker, 30th Century Man, We Are X about X Japan, The Rolling Stones doc, Stones in Exile, and Backstreet Boys, Show Them What You're Made Of. That's a wide swath, you know? (laughs) It's a large, that's, that's covering quite a lot of musical ground, but he's also a huge Smith fan, so he is perfect for today's discussion. Please welcome to Totally 80s, first time guest, Stephen Kayak. Hi, hey, Stephen. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Likewise. Sorry, I have my totally 90s mug. Is that, am, I, am I okay with that? My, my, <sighs> we'll just my, edit it in post. Slow dive. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's fair enough because I think so many 90s <laughs> bands, you know, Slow Dive being one of them, but Suede and Pulp and the list goes on. They they obviously oh, yeah. are descendants of Smith. So we're going to you know, make an executive decision and let it slide this time. This time. Okay. But, I've been warned. So obviously the Smiths influence is widespread. Um, you know, it has inspired bands that followed them. It has inspired this whole movie. So I'm going to just take a wild guess, Stephen, and assume that you grew up being a big Smiths fan yourself. And that's what, it, uh, you know, inspired this film. <laughs> Bingo. Yeah, I was a big Smiths fan. I was a big music fan. I mean, you know, uh, first waiver right here. You know, I grew up in the 80s. Uh my first Smith's record was an impulse buy at the mall. You know, I thought probably it was like a junior, probably something like that. I know we were playing hooky from uh, band practice or something. I don't know. It was just, you know, I got, uh, it was How Soon Is Now was the first one. I got that 12 inch um, just because it had that slightly homoerotic cover and it just looked cool. Um, and uh, it just started a lifelong uh, obsession with the music. Yeah. Were you as obsessed as one of the main characters in your film, Shoplifters of the World. This is actually a semi-true story. You took some liberties, but it's based on a true story about a super fan who on that dark day in 1987? Seven. 87, I'm still trying to block it out, you know. I'm still trying <laughs> to suppress the memory. But that dark day in 1987 when the Smiths broke up rather shockingly, like I said, they had, had they were at the top of their game, but they had a pretty short run, only five years. They could have gone much longer. Much, you know, their peers were talking about bands like the Cure and Depeche Mode. They're still around. This band only had five years, but it ended in 1987. And one fan in Colorado was so distraught and wanted to commemorate the sad day that he attempted or at least considered taking a radio station hostage and forcing him to play a music marathon of all the Smiths. You take that kernel of an idea and explode it into a full fledged post punk fantasy in your film. But were you 
Was your level of fandom like that extreme? Oh, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Good. Okay. Good. I mean, Makes you know, for a good story, though. It was, makes for a great story. I mean, you always have to find that hyper dramatic core of an idea. And, you know, it's operatic in a way, right? It's just this like super melodramatic gesture. Uh, it's an urban myth. You know, uh, we've heard that people said, oh, they just remade Airheads and put the Smiths <laughs> on. I'm like, that was probably based on the, this thing that happened, right? The Smith story was the original kernel of that uh, idea. Yeah, this poor guy, uh, James Kiss, if you're out there anywhere, dude, we've been trying to get a hold. Uh, we, I wanted to interview him in the in the end credits and just, you know, really ask him what went down and why. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, he's been interviewed uh, in the paper. Like, people found him and talked to him later in life. But, yeah, he was just a troubled young man. How old who, was he? Uh, Do you mind me asking? I think he was, I think he was, he was like a teenager. Okay, he was, he was a teenager. You know. So, like, you know, because, you know, obviously it, it could be a little scary to interview someone like James Kiss. He is a guy that considered no. holding up a radio station at gunpoint. But he was just like a troubled kid, right? He's a okay troubled, now. A troubled teen, totally okay. fine. I think he's gone on to work with youth. That oh, You know, cool. he's, it was, a, apparently it was a moment in his life when he needed help himself. He was going through some stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. He thought, and the reason he actually didn't go through with it because he just ultimately thought, I just really don't want anyone to get hurt. Good, you know, total Smiths fan, right? He goes there, guns blazing, and just goes like, "Oh, but no, I can't." <laughs> Maybe this um, is a bad idea. I don't know. It's really sweet, but it, it blossomed into this, you know, this tall tale. How which, interesting that there was yeah. a song by the Smiths called Panic, but the it said hang the DJ in in that. I feel like there's some kind of connection because this guy was protesting against the DJs that were playing formulate music, i.e. not the Smiths at the time. Interesting. Exactly. Exactly. Obviously, we're going to talk about the Smiths. We're going to talk about the fandom. The obvious jumping up, jumping off point was to talk about your film. But what is it about the Smiths? Very open ended question. But guys, what is mm. it about the Smiths? Could this movie have been made about? any other band of its era could this could any other band of the era have inspired that kind of extreme fandom that someone would consider holding up a radio station just to hear a music marathon like and this fandom continues to this day and not just among people who were you know first wave fans who liked him in the 80s there are teenagers now who are still obsessed with morrissey what mm. is it about this band which like i have said had a, was a blip in time when you think about it. Five albums, five years, and what? And then they were done. Never reunited, despite you know ongoing clamor and Coachella rumors that persist to this day. What is it that made this legacy so lasting, and the fandom surrounding it so extreme? Yeah, a hard question to answer. I think part of it is it ended at the peak, right? A lot of people will argue five perfect records you know uh pretty much five perfect records a string of singles and compilations i mean it's an unimpeachable musical legacy right i mean it's just great music the imagery was so stark and distinctive that it just you know it created a cult you know but like you, those bands back then it was tribal you know you've got your fantastic robert smith smith's twist shirt on you know so all these bands had like you could you could adopt it as a costume and as an, a badge of honor, as a way of life, right? They were a way of life. You don't, I don't think you get that much today, you know, like bands as ways of life, right? They were a philosophy. They were like a club. It was you against everything else, right? If you were like a Smith fan and granted, we all liked the usual suspects, you know, I mean, what Smith's fan probably didn't have Depeche Mode and The Cure and New Order and Equin the Bunnymen and Susie and such in their collections. But the Smiths, I think there was something so passionate about the response to them mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's 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 in the DNA of, of those songs. I think the tension between the, the music and the lyrics and probably the tensions in the band themselves mm -hmm. just created something uh, indelible and long lasting. And then when you take it away, you know, granted Morrissey continues, but like that legacy, it's just so potent. I mean, but I can see there's, there's a few bands, like if they had gone out at that peak, you know, like I, I, there's only a few, I think that reached that level of like iconic, passionate freak out, fandom mm -hmm. right i think depeche mode would be kind of in that category 
Absolutely. Maybe the, maybe Duran Duran, the Duran okay. fans are Absolutely. just like that goes deep. I can't think of many others from that era that would be that. I mean, the I'd Cure put, probably. Yeah, I would put the Cure in there, but the Smiths kind of like are in their own little world, hence why they deserve True. they could inspire an entire film like this. So, I want to try to get into the entry points of the catalog. You mentioned, Stephen, that your first song you ever heard by them or bought by them was How Soon Is Now. That is my first song that I, I think probably a lot of people would say that, especially in mm. America, maybe in, in England, right. they would say it was this right. charming man. But in this country, they'd say how soon is now. And what's really interesting to me, I grew up in LA, so I had K-Rock and they played the hell out of that song. Mm. Uh, it was many years before I realized that song was a B-side, right? Yeah. That song was Originally. a B-side. I think John mm -hmm. probably could bring the facts. That song was a B-side to William. It was really nothing, I think. Not and like it was only on the 12 inch. Okay. So does okay. anyone know the story of how a B side ended up becoming arguably the Smith's most popular song, even though it actually isn't that representative of, of the sonics of their actual catalog. It's kind of an outlier in their catalog, but it became their most iconic song on our former uh, totally eighties guest, Rob Sheffield from Rolling Stone, he ranked all 73 songs by the Smiths, and he put the song at number five. Yeah. I'm not going to do the spoiler mm -hmm. yet. We'll get to what number one. Yeah. Is that blasphemous to put how soon is now at number Shocking. five? Anyway, oh, totally. it's, wherever you want to put it, I think it's safe to say it's one of the top five songs by the Smiths, and certainly their most well-known, and yet it was a B-side. How did this happen? How did it become? Was it K-Rock? K-Rock started playing it. Yeah, all right it on the air and it spread from there and it you know i think all three of us we got a hat trick here it was my first smith song because it was the mm. first smith song that had a music video made for it against the band's will who did not want to do music videos sire records in america put it together using found live footage and backstage stuff and, and didn't even tell the band originally that they did it and mtv started playing it on 120 minutes i saw it i was like this a uh, boing changed my life. I ran out and bought Mita's Murder, uh, and it was all uphill from there. And <laughs> did you become a vegetarian after no, that? No, I didn't get that much into it. Do you? You know, you mentioned another fact I didn't know was the fact that the band didn't want a video made for that. And it's interesting to me that they didn't want videos made at all when they're, you know, Stephen was talking about the imagery, the homoerotic imagery on the album cover that spoke to him. They had such an iconic image in terms of how they dress, the haircuts, you know, the kind of like B movie, you know, matinee idol stills, Billy Fury or whatever they would put on their covers. But do you know how how they felt about the fact that this song became, which, like I said, was initially intended as a B side and also kind of didn't necessarily completely represent the the Smith sound? Like, how did they feel about this becoming? one of their signature songs, if not their absolute biggest, you know, signature song. Well, I think didn't, I mean, I believe they initially were really very proud of it. And then there was always tension with the label, right? In terms of what was going to get picked and what was going to get really promoted. And I think there was a lot of confusion around how to lead with that single. And and having to then turn around and do an A side with it after the fact, you know, it kind of lost a little momentum and might not have, you know, maybe if it had been the the A side would have been a better bigger chart hit. It was a slow burn, right? I mean, it's the one that emerges years later, but I think at the time it was a bit of a missed opportunity because they had already kind of burned through uh, people already owned it, right? Mm. They already had it on a few formats. And then they go and put another 12 inch out and people are like, yeah, I have that, you know? So it didn't rack up the sales that could have propelled it to a bigger chart position. There's lots of, that. lots of that kind of thing that happened along the way. Not only know, that, with a lot of their singles. It wasn't even on Meet His Murder anywhere else, but the That's state true. siren mm -hmm. added it. So if you were in the UK and you bought that album on Rough Trade, you missed out. You didn't get that as a bonus track, as it were. And they had a weird, you know, Rough Trade, they they called the shots. Smiths called the shots when it came to Rough Trade. When it came to America, Sire was just stepping all over them. I mean, it started with my, this charming man when they did a New York disco remix. That's without right, the remixes. Well, that sounds like something I would like to listen to, actually. I like disco, I like New York, and I like the Smiths. 
but I've it's never got, heard that it, before. It's got a little stompy, hand clappy dance break in the middle. That's about the only <laughs> difference. All right. But, Is it good? Is it worth me checking out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No? Right. Yes, yes, no? Okay. I'll give it a six. <laughs> more, more, dance to it. <laughs> Morris was mortally offended by it, but it's yeah. not bad by any stretch. Yeah. So uh, there was always that push and pull with the American label. So is it wrong to say then that how soon is now going back to that since that was the entry point for all three of us or for a lot of Smiths fans? Is it wrong to say that's the quintessential Smiths song? It's not, right? Probably if you're a real Smiths fan, you probably don't think it is. I I think it's one of it's one of those questions where it's like, how long is a piece of string? You know, I mean it's like it's one of the <laughs> all time great. But, you know, I've seen lists upon lists that just shuffle the best track or best album, you know, and everyone's got an opinion, right? I mean, to me, yep. it is obviously when it's when it's one of your first entry points, it's going to be the one that sinks in the deepest. And it's just it's just an epic piece of music. Let's just not get around it. It's so cinematic and emotional and swoony, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, going goth dancing at nightclubs, uh, <laughs> at the time and you know just twirling around on a dance floor in between like a cocktail twin song and a front 242 and they just drop that and the whole place would fall out you know i mean it was the greatest thing ever and if you went to those goth clubs hoping to meet someone <laughs> and you didn't meet anyone that night did those words echo in your head i remember i was there talking i yeah. mean the line like there's a club where you'd like to go you might meet somebody who really loves you and you go and you stay on your own you leave on your own and you go and you cry and you want to die cry and you want to die and you want to i mean god that has spoke every time i went to a club hoping to meet someone as cute as johnny marr it didn't happen those lines spoke <laughs> to me i had a conversation once with someone who was newly single and I was like, oh, you should go out. And he was like, I don't want to meet people at clubs. He's like, I don't want my life to be like, how soon is now? Like it became, <laughs> a, you know, a meme almost. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you said that though, Lindsay, because we're, we're all of a certain age now. We listen to that and we kind of chuckle like, oh God, how drama queen. But <laughs> That's the beauty of his lyrics. When you're 17, 18 years old, I mean, that, really affected me and it was like oh this is my life this is and i took it deadly seriously you know looking back now i do think there is a hint of irony and humor in that song intentionally mm. but at the time it was dead serious and i, I we can't forget that because you know we're all older now we look back and we're like oh morrissey come on get a grip mm. but well we, we got it that's actually an interesting point about the humor. His lyrics, you know, I'm just reading titles here. I'm, I mean, this is like, heaven knows I'm miserable now. Please, please, please let me get what I want. Last night I dreamt that somebody loved me. I mean, it almost borders on parody. In fact, I think somewhere on the internet, there is actually like a Morsi lyric generator where you could like type in a few <laughs> things that will like have something about how like how miserable and, you know, how the Girlfriend world means nothing. In a coma. Well, that, that definitely was cheeky. But in general, do you think Morrissey got this reputation for being this sad sack, this miserableist, uh, not not for being a bad lyricist at all. Of course, he's the guy who introduced me to what like Keats and Yates and Oscar Wilde were exactly. all in one song, all in one line of a song. But yeah. he was known as this kind of like almost parody level miserableist. But there was humor there that I think some people didn't pick up on, certainly if they were young and miserable themselves. So. Oh, absolutely. But like, you know, uh, like you say, uh, John, I mean, he he did mean it, too. Right. I mean, there <laughs> is. And, you know, and then you're at a certain age, you know, and it just goes it goes deep. You just you really take a lot of that to heart and you were able to wrap yourself up in it and make yourself feel better, you know, leaning into someone else's misery. Weren't you? I mean, you know. You get me. You feel my. That was kind of you. You felt understood and heard through that music, and uh, I mean, I, I always look. Cause I come at it through the closet of for the, the perspective of someone who was in the closet at the time, you know, kind of on the verge of coming out. Didn't really happen until college. So that stuff, you know, it's coded. It's like secret. It's got mm. little gay messages and or things you think you know you can relate to. So you're you're kind of picking up on those things too. So you want it to really you want him to mean it. You want him you know, to mean it. You wanted him to mean it because it meant a lot to you at the time. It was But yeah, you're right. He it's hilarious. I mean it's if you ever thing. need self-validation, meet me in the alley <laughs> by the railway station. I'm like, oh girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? What can he be talking about? I wonder. 
<laughs> through the lens of a white suburban closeted teenager, like myself and Stephen, apparently, um, we have this person saying things that we never dared say out loud. This charming man, he's singing to a man. He's singing, you know, uh, <gasps> He's picking, up a, he's picking up a dude that's picking him up on the street and like, wait, your bite's broken? Come on, I'll give you a ride. <laughs> you know, at the time, I knew something was there. I didn't know what. It was like, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decode this, but I know he was talking to me. And that's why there's this army of people that still, even, yes. even the Latino yes. community, it's working class. It's... um. It, that's why they are attracted to us. It's literalism in the, in the lyrics. You don't get you don't get a Smith song where you know the inter interpretation's up to you. No, they're very literal. Here is what this song is about. That, there you go. We answered. It took us a minute, but we answered the question why this is still so enduring and why there are younger generations. But do you guys know the uh, you know gener younger generations that are still picking up on the lyrics, discovering and falling in love with the Smiths today? But do you know that comic strip, great pop things? It's a comic strip Ooh. I love. Well, here's yeah. a joke. Can I tell you a joke since we're talking on the subject of Morrissey and humor? Okay. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Morrissey. Morrissey who? See, I told you I didn't have any friends. <laughs> That's the fantastic Morrissey knock, knock joke from the comic strip Great Pop Things. It's probably better if you're actually looking at the drawings of Morrissey, like with huge oversized, like caricature glasses on and stuff. But I did, I, I just wanted to tell that joke because, you know, that was my attempt to do stand up. But, you know, he's easily, what I'm trying to say is he's easily um, parodied. You know, John, you use the word drama queen, but that's like the best. That's what's so great about it. I do think, you know, do you think he gave people like yourselves who, you know, you're coming out from the different perspective of being closeted suburban teens in uh, the 80s. Did he give you kind of permission to sort of, maybe go there a little bit more yourselves, even if it was just like singing along to like lyrics in the car or whatever, you know, to tap mm. into your inner drama queen, so to speak. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it was more about, it kind of was like from the outside in, in a way. Right. I mean, you started by imitating the look. Easily and, emulated. You need which, could, routines, which, insert. oh yeah. Which, you know, be, again, became like a bit of a, uh, an, like armor against, you know, it was like your defense mechanism. Like, I'm not gay. I'm new wave. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you could just be like, you know, you just, and all of us. Sorry. I think like, that should be on a t-shirt. or it's something. hilarious. You know I'm what I mean? Gay. When I first, I thought I was Robert Smith and I got cardigans, you know, and you could like <laughs> cover it over with these co cool costumes that othered you and made you like a character, a character in a way. And, you know, like a little weird superhero. You had like a costume you could put on and uh, the music was your soundtrack and you didn't have to kind of worry about that scary thing of like coming out and identifying as something, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, would it have been better if he had just said, I like dudes. And, like, he saying, always like, said he was celibate, right? The first I know, time I think I even heard of the concept of celibacy was when he said it probably in some explosive like British Melody Maker enemy yeah. interview that he was celibate and it became a thing. That was like, you know, that the vegetarianism, the whole platform mm -hmm. of that. I mean, you know, it was kind of a precursor to straight edge or to emo, to a lot mm -hmm. of things. To, but John, yeah, what think, was it? Tell, I'd like you to speak on what um, Stephen was. In the age of AIDS, I think it would have had a very different ending had he come out. Uh, mm -hmm. then I think it would have been very different. I think they would have gotten pigeonholed as a gay band, uh, you like know, Bronsky like, beat or something, exactly, or, you know, so it, it, you know, Steven said it all. It was armor. You know, you got, you, you put your hair up in that pompadour. I did it. I've got pictures. I wore a trench coat. I wore blue jeans. And the more I tried to make myself this protected person that didn't deal with all this stuff that was going on in the background, the more girls hit on me. And it's like, no. Yeah, <laughs> there was, you go. <laughs> you became attractive to the opposite sex yeah. because of the sensitive, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I probably would have hit on you, John. It was it was strange. But I liked uh, I liked all those more Seymour looking guys at the time. I had no trouble at prom. <laughs> I'll just say that. Junior or senior prom. Well, you know that uh, that's interesting because I recently, a few years ago in 2017, when um when Johnny Marr released his 2017, 18, when he released his last solo record, I interviewed him and obviously he is, is not gay, but he did talk about how obviously while Morrissey and the Smiths kind of spoke to young gay boys, it kind of just spoke to boys 
who did not want to be macho, did not want to be jocks, that wanted to be sensitive and stuff. And this, I'm going to read a little bit of the quote he said because that was pretty interesting. He said, when we arrived in the United States in 1985 to do those big tours, we were playing in these big venues and it was reflected on me and my band that we were good news for a generation of kids, boys and girls, but let's just say the boys who wanted to not be macho, who wanted to be a new kind of guy without having a label of being gay or straight. All they knew was they just didn't want to be a jock. This was news to me. I was picking up from our audience and younger, younger journalists about this sort of culture. He's speaking specifically to American culture. Macho, aggressive. It was very old fashioned. And we were these young men from the UK who it didn't matter if we were married, wearing makeup. I guess it was a new way of being. I think there was a lot of projection on young British bands and I'm proud of New Order and the Smiths and the Cure and Depeche Mode and being part of a movement of bands because we did that. And then he said, if we helped to wipe out a certain kind of mentality in the college years around the 1980s, I feel that's good. So they wiped out jock culture. So, you know, whether it was, <laughs> there was a fluid sexuality or just a fluid idea of what gender was that, yeah, they didn't totally wipe out jock culture, but they tried. Thanks, well, Smith, for trying. They tried their best. They but, disappeared in 87, then hair metal happened. Coincidence? Exactly. Maybe, maybe. But yeah, I mean, in the film, in Shoplifters of the World, you know, he it's interesting because I know you took a little bit of liberties, obviously, with the story, Stephen, in that in the true story, this guy, James Kiss, was going to take hostage and then thought better of it of a top 40 radio station. But was there any symbolism to the fact that in your film, you made it a metal radio station, you pit like the metal versus the, the new wave against each other? Oh yeah. It was just a stronger image. It was just a lot more fun to work with. Um, and, uh, it was like, you know, I was, uh, I was a little metal head when I was in middle school, you know, so it, you're, you're, you're working with things that are, you understand and that are in you, you know, and, um, I don't know, it was just a lot more fun to, to write. It just sort of was like our first idea, you know, like, Oh yeah, it's like late at night. It's like a metal marathon. It just it flowed off the tongue, you know. Full metal Mickey, metal marathon. I'm like, oh, this will be great because it's so much more comical, you know, and it's so aggressive and it's so overly masculine. Uh, it was just a great, uh, you know, antagonist to our sensitive little thug. Well, that's that's the point I was trying to make that, yes, the what the Smiths were doing and some of their peers were doing definitely spoke to queer kids, but I think it just spoke to a lot of disenfranchised people a lot of disenfranchised young boys like the yep. one who is the the main character in your film who just were like i'm not a jock and i'm not you know the girls don't really like me and i go to the club and i stand on my own and leave on my own and but i liked those boys i would have been completely hitting on you john to, with no <laughs> success had i known you when you were wearing the cardigan and all that i would have taken you to prom at least we would have had a good time too <laughs> yeah, we would have exactly. had as but, friends what do you think in general, you know, the terms like there's a lot of talk about gender today and, and um, sexuality, you know, whether you're fluid, whether you're pansexual, bisexual, uh, those things weren't really discussed, not in like real terms back then the way they are now. Do you think Morrissey was sort of a, like a forerunner of that discussion, hmm. that idea, that idea that like, you know, that it was a more fluid thing, that it wasn't so binary, that it wasn't so like you're a man and you're macho and you're like this, you know? I, well, like it, it did, it, yeah, it did open up new images and possibilities for masculinity. I know that L.R. Coltrane, who plays Dean, who holds up the station, you know, has said this in interviews that he, yeah, as he is himself sort of trying to figure out where he lands on the, the gender spectrum, uh, that that's kind of what he appreciates the most about it is that it presented new ways to be or present as a you know as masculine there were like different opportunities to you and you know the lyrics sometimes were you know gendered in different ways and you know what persona is he singing in is it a man singing to a man is he taking on a female persona but that was happening a lot in the 80s though i think there's oh, yeah. a lot of wiggle room around there so they were definitely within the zeitgeist uh but, you know, it was a more, I don't know, more literary attack, shall we say, of those tropes. What would you say, I mean, I think we're all going to be in agreement with this, but we're, we're trying to talk about what the quintessential Smith song is. And that's a hard thing to answer. But I think it's kind of obvious what the quintessential album is. 
Can we all? It came out 35 years ago this year. If that is a hint, I, everybody's going to say the queen is dead, right? Yeah. Dead. Are, do you disagree? Do you disagree, Joe? Well, no, I think if you have a farmer's market poll and you go to, you go to 10 people at the farmer's market and you ask them their favorites from this album. <laughs> let's do all, that now. Let's, yeah, let's do, do that. Is that something you do? Like when you go to the farmer's market, well, you like farm, get out a clipboard and be like, what's your top cure album? I always go to the, farmer, Check. the farmer's market poll. Is my, my <laughs> and, you know, for, but then you get like the hyper smiths fans like us we're probably going to say different things uh so i'm going to say queen is dead i just have are to. you yeah alternative press you know declared it the best album of the entire 80s which is you know not just the best smiths album or the best album of 86 but i mean what i think is interesting about this record i mean it was the first it was actually the first smiths album i bought so much like steven was saying how soon is now is the first single he bought you know you always remember your first mm -hmm. but this album, you know, is held up critically as their masterpiece. As I said, Alternative Press declared it the best album of the entire decade. It's so friggin' English. I mean, it opens with like a six minute track about like the royal family and the monarchy, and it's like super English. And yet it was, you know, such a huge record here. And I think, you know, in light of various things, you know, obviously Morrissey's stance on things may have changed. He might be a royalist now for all we know. Uh, it might be, you know, he's probably a Tory, but the, uh, you know, we're, we're talking we're in the era of like Brexit and even the era of what, you know, is kind of jokingly called Megxit with like Meghan Markle and Prince Harris leaving the Royal family and moving to America. Johnny Marr actually put in his Instagram stories. Sadly, mm -hmm. it was a Photoshop pic. I wish it was not Photoshop. It was a picture of Meghan Markle <laughs> wearing a Queen is oh, Dead t-shirt. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I wish it was real. Genius. Someone send her a shirt. But it was so British and yet so but yet American kids like your film takes place in Colorado, something that is like almost a whole other podcast is here growing up in Los Angeles, which has a huge Mexican community like Morrissey is a god among the Latin community. So much so that about 10 years ago, he did a co headlining, you know, double bill show at the Greek theater with Juanis. Like mm -hmm. he's, you know, the, the biggest um, tribute band in Los Angeles to Morrissey is the Sweet and Tender Hooligans. And it is um, fronted by Jose Maldonado, who calls himself the Mexican Morrissey. So like this went beyond the British audience. This went to the Latin audience. This was a huge hit in America, but it was so friggin' English. The things he was singing about, even like some of the slang. I didn't know what a vicar when he had, there was a song called Vicar and a Tutu. I'm like, what's a vicar? Like, I didn't know that, you know? So mm -hmm. what is it? I mean, maybe you guys disagree that it is their best or their quintessential album. But since it is like an album that, you know, I think is, is for one, it celebrates 35th anniversary as we speak. What do you think was it about this record? You know, because I'm thinking about other British bands that are, you know, like Pulp or Suede or Blur's Park Life even that kind of couldn't mm -hmm. really connect here because of the fact that they or like a band like the streets mike skinner of the streets mm -hmm. so english and yet this is a record that would make people in colorado want to hold up a radio station what is it about this record i it's interesting you mentioned some of the brit pop bands you know because i think at that point it was such a reaction against american music right it was kind of like a trying to a reclaiming of their territory mm. that they doubled down so hard on the Englishness of their identity, that it it kind of, I think it's the beginning of the chipping away of the cults, right? Where things started getting a little more compartmentalized, right? In a way, whereas that, I think what you see with The Queen is Dead, it was a moment when this kind of music in general was starting to just bust out all over. It wasn't just the Smiths, right? I mean, who was having big hits at that time? I mean, the Cure was cresting into their imperial phase, if you will, right? I mean, you get 101, Depeche Mode, like actually laying waste to America whenever they would tour. It was just all, kind all of, those bands Johnny Marr was talking about. Yeah, like they were starting to just take over. And I think this just came at a, it was a perfect time. And it's a great album. I mean, track for track, it's just excellent songwriting beautiful production, you know, sweeping, melancholy, it rocks out, it's got gorgeous ballads, cheeky little outro with some girls are bigger than others. Yep, I mean, the whole, there you go. the whole package, they've got that iconic photograph on the inner bag, you know, with them at the Salford Lads Club. 
I just think they nailed something, everything about it, like the style, they looked awesome. It's just one of those like perfect moments, isn't it? Even like, you know, I, I'm really partial to like me just murder and then louder than bombs just, mm -hmm. you know, for personal reasons and, you know, things that were happening maybe in my life at the time and just the scope of like that great compilation. But yeah, no, Queen is dead is it towers. It's almost like you just can't argue with it. Can you? Can I ask you one quick thing since we were talking about those British bands, like that obviously are descended from the Smiths and also were like very proud of reclaiming their Britishness, like pulp and suede, the mm -hmm. character in your film, the DJ metal Mickey, mm -hmm. is that a suede reference? Oh, absolutely. I think it was the first thing that came to my head. It's like awesome. full metal Mickey. I've got it. Yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> awesome. absolutely absolutely did you i know that uh i you didn't grow up in los angeles john but where did you grow up um steven uh, new england massachusetts okay so not a huge Latin. Yeah. was there a huge latin community there no not at all because well, you're aware of the say, fact that morrissey is so huge in mexico and so oh, huge in God. south america and so yeah, yeah. huge among um if you go to a concert in los angeles i'm looking at from oh. completely a los angeles oh, native yeah. point of view the audience will be I would say more than 50% at this point. Uh, oh yeah. I've Latin. lived, I've lived here now for like 13 years, I think. And I've, I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, when, I don't know if you went to any of the palladium where he, he did that like residency at the palladium. Some whole years week ago. There, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And I, that was, that was like the first time I really witnessed the Mexicans for Morrissey, the kids with the tattoos and just like, it was an awesome rockabilly looks like the best styled fans you'll ever see in your life. And, you know, life as a pigsty comes up and everyone's got the lighters out and they're just like, you know, swaying along. Uh, it was there was a lot of emotion in that room. It's very different from you, uh, other fan bases. Have you seen the documentary? Is it really so strange from 2004, yeah. which is specifically yeah. about I haven't seen that. But since you're it's a documentarian cool. filmmaker, I thought what was did they have any theories about it? Because I've read theories that what the Smiths do, despite that, they're like so so English and from Manchester and Morrissey is of Irish descent that they tapped into like the ranchera genre with the dramatic lyrics, the, you mm -hmm. know, the, the drama, the romance, you know, the passion, and that somehow that connected in a way um, over here in the uh, Latin American community with, with that maybe other British bands didn't the cure and Depeche mode as well, but the Smiths, it's like a, a thing enough to have well, a you, whole documentary made about this phenomenon. Yeah. Well, you're the ranchero stuff. It's the singers that their parents would have listened to would have been those kind of 50s crooners. And he's mm. he's apparently there's like a, a something in his voice. Right. It's the delivery. It's that slightly atonal warble that he gets sometimes. Uh, it just sounds exactly it's like it's it, it triggers, uh, you know, sense memory from childhood. And it's it feels familiar. And uh, and then it's just the themes in the music. Right. And the lyrics. It's the the outsider it's the diaspora of right not belonging to this culture or that culture and feeling in between and mm. and then here's somebody who understands you because you are an outsider and uh wraps you up in this imagery that reminds you of things from your past and is comforting but also gives you something to hang on to and make a new identity out of so Interesting. Well, going back to the subject of The Queen is Dead, I mentioned a while ago that Rob Sheffield on his ranking of all 73 mm. Smith songs, he put How Soon Is Now at number five. That's, you know, a respectable showing. Some people might say it should be higher, but do you want to guess what was at number one? I'll give you a hint. It's a song off The Queen is Dead. It probably won't be very hard for you to guess. I'm guessing he put Boy with a Thorn in his side at number one. No. There's John, there would you like to guess? There is oh, a light. Well, oh, there is a light, of course. Of course. The, there is a light. What else could it be? It is. There is a light. It never goes out, which will make me now get, read off another joke from the Great Pop Things comic <laughs> strip. How many more C's does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, because there is a light that never goes out. <laughs> ah. All right. Thank you. I'll be here all night. Um, but yeah, let's talk about this song, because I think... I think now it may be sort of overtaking how soon as now is like the song. Like this is a song that people play at weddings. This is a song that people play at funerals. This is a love song people dedicate. It's got a pretty morose sentiment, you know, it's like a death wish song, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's actually a very, very sweet song. I think you go back to the code. There is a code in this song and in a darkened mm -hmm. underpass, I thought, Oh God, my chances come at last. But yep. that strange fear gripped me, and I just couldn't ask. 16-year-old John went, mm. 
<laughs> exactly. That's the one. That's the one. You know. Are there any other lyrics, coded lyrics that um, oh, left out to either of you? Well, I mean, favorite ones of yours. That's oh probably, God. Yeah. That's that's definitely one. Like I mentioned, the one about you know, the the meet me in the alley. You definitely have a clue about what that's all about. Um, never oh, had no one ever. Never had no one ever. You know, Where I'm outside that? your yeah. house. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it's a stalker song, but it's also <laughs> lightly coded where you can't really tell someone how you feel. We've talked a lot about Morrissey. I'm sorry. Did you have any other lyrics? Uh, my favorite lyric being, you know, a cis straight woman was from actually my favorite Morrissey, my favorite Smith song is the B-side. Speaking of B-sides of this charming man is, I assume you guys know the song, Gene. That's my favorite oh, oh. Smith song. My, really? Uh, yeah. I love that song. There is a light that never goes out is my second favorite, but you know, the, he has just like a bitterness to his lyrics. I mean, you, you know, for as much as we can talk about the humor in some of the songs or the romance and the swooniness or the coded messages to, to queer, queer people or to the disenfranchised. Sometimes I just like what he's just like being a, a snarky bitch. There was a rumor <laughs> once there was a, it turned out to just be a rumor, but there was a rumor once that he was going to be a guest judge on RuPaul's Drag Race UK. And I lost my mind. Can you imagine if that, no. I guess it didn't happen. I don't know. Someone, someone said they'd heard it and I got like overly excited. Turned um, out not to be. Can you imagine Morrissey kind of with amazing. his withering critiques, his withering, but my favorite line from Gene is uh, there's ice in the sink where we bathe. I just love that. How can you call this a home <laughs> when you know it's a grave? Oh. <laughs> He just has yeah. a way of uh, a cutting way about him. He really does. He's someone I'd actually, I've never interviewed and I don't know if I'd want to interview him because if you got on his bad side, he'd prop, you'd probably be scarred for life from it. Uh, for life. Yeah. <laughs> probably best for those drag Queens that he did not end just up back away. Yep. But anyway, as I was saying, we've talked a lot about the, um, you know, the iconography of Morrissey, his influence, you know, his standing as an LGBTQ icon, his problematicness in recent years, his lyrics, his look. But we got to talk about Marr. We got, you know, I mentioned Johnny Marr at the, you know, at the top of the show making the joke. There is actually a book. I'm, you guys may have read it. It's called Morrissey Marr, The Severed Alliance, because it has oh, to have a dramatic yeah. title like all things Morrissey. But obviously you mentioned a, a while back, Stephen, that it was like kind of the tension within the band that was part of their magic. And it's an interesting plot device in your film where when Metal Mickey, the metal DJ, and who plays him again? I'm sorry that I'm back. <laughs> sorry, Joe Manganiello. Yeah, that's a great, amazing how, casting. How, how can you forget that? I feel because he's really oh, actually boy. quite transformed in the film. It's a credit to Steven that he does not look like, you know, the person I'm you see in the tabloids it. on a <laughs> Sofia Vergara's arm. You know, he like he has long hair and he's all metaled out. But anyway, to go back, I apologize for not knowing that. But the metal Mickey character, the, the first chink in the metal armor when he is now being forced to play at gunpoint all of these Smith songs for a night. The first time where he kind of perks up and goes, actually, maybe this isn't so bad is because of Mars guitar playing, which yes. is cute. And that sort of opens the door. And before you know it, they're talking about the New York dolls and, you know, it's, it's game on. And, you know, if only things could be this easy, but <laughs> if know. only people could come together, just united by the love of Johnny Mars guitar playing, well, it, but let's discuss. It was a simpler time. Yeah. It, but it's let's funny discuss you say that. that. Because I surrounded in Ohio, surrounded by metalheads, all everyone in my high school, Def Leppard ruled, um, you know, Judas Priest. It was that whole era. It, but they loved songs like London, you know, mm -hmm. and I believe Anthrax even has covered London. And you really listen to that song and it's, you know, got these metal drums and this squealing guitar. And it's really good. And the one interesting thing about the tension of this band, you've got Mike Joyce playing the drums, you know, keeping the beat. But Andy Rourke is doing something completely different melodically than Johnny is doing over here. And Morrissey is singing across the music, not with it. You've got three very different melodic things happening all at once. And I think that really speaks to them just throwing some rules out the window and doing what they thought sounded good. And it just mm -hmm. it, it worked. But would you, I would actually venture to say, you know, when you look at um, lists of like the top, 
whatever number most influential guitarists of all time or best guitarists of all time you know you get mostly hard rock and classic rock people you get the mm -hmm. obvious ones you get hendrix and clapton and eddie van halen and, you know the list goes on but more but mar often uh ends up being in there uh, and he often is the only one representing kind of like the what you would call alternative rock or college mm -hmm. rock or new wave genre. So me not being a guitar player myself, but do you guys have any insight into what it was that he did differently? Because as you said, John, rules were out the window with this band. I, I'm a drummer by trade, so I, I don't know the intricacies and complexities of what he's doing. But you, when you research it and you understand where he's coming from, and what he was trying to do, I mean, he was trying to like be all four of, you know, uh, you know, he, he'd try to be like multiple musicians at the same time, you know, like he'd try to play like an entire bird song and fuse all the different parts and maybe add a little rockabilly on the, on the bass. And he was really like, it, there, there's such complex constructions, you know, cause it was really all on him uh, to create these melodic environments. And he would do it just like by himself. You know, obviously, like you say, the bass is also coming in and doing something different. But just in terms of the, the songwriting uh, and how nimble uh, he was, I just don't think anyone fused those influences like that at the time or since. He's really unique in that way. He tells a story about the recording of what difference does it or um, mm. yeah, what difference does it make, where he says, if you listen to it, it's a Motown song. You may not mm -hmm. realize it, but it's a Motown song. And Morrissey uh, very specifically said, we will not have synthesizers. We will not have horn sections. Mm -hmm. And he wanted a horn section at the end of what difference does it make. So we thought, okay, I'm just going to stack these guitars so it mm -hmm. sounds like a horn section at the end. That da -da, da -da -da. Mm -hmm. to be horns. And since he couldn't have horns per the rules, <laughs> he made it with the guitars. And so he just had this... Mm -hmm cool stacking of uh different uh different layers and, and different tracks until you became this full orchestra almost yeah and his it, the way the way he was able to synthesize influences is really interesting like on how soon is now for example the little ding 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 ding, ding, ding like the little end riff he's actually directly quoting love bug starsky's you Gotta Believe, which was like a club track at the time, which was a synthesizer line, a real distinct riff. And here he is playing it on a guitar, you know, and just folding it, because he he loved dance music, right? Johnny would go to the gay clubs. He loved disco and electro and all this stuff. He loved New York, you know, the New York sound. And was he was hoovering this stuff up and kind of retransmitting it, you know, with the 60s pop with the rockabilly, it's awesome when you really break down what he's doing musically. Here is the the big riddle. So like I said, there is a book called Morrissey and Mar, The Severed Alliance. The alliance has been severed. I think it's safe to say that while almost every other band that has broken up, even ones that you thought you would, ne would never get together, like Guns N' Roses or The Replacements, they eventually get back together, at least in some configuration, maybe with not all the members, but it happens. It's pretty safe to say that this alliance is severed. I'm gonna do the <laughs> I'm gonna do the Oprah thing. Was it did you sever it or was it severed? It is severed. It's not gonna happen. Um, which I think is for the best in light of um what you were saying, Stephen, about how like the fact that they broke up at their peak is what created this magic and this mythology around them. And also in you know, light of what Morris has become, you know, it's inevitable that probably a, a reunion would be a bit disappointing, but they've gone down some interesting paths ever since. Obviously, Morrissey has had his share of, you know, he's had some a good number of solo hits, a respectable solo catalog, still definitely could tour. Mars gone in this crazy, incredibly unorthodox direction where he, you know, he's done all sorts of amazing um, cinematic work with Hans Zimmer. He's been a member, uh, like not just like a guest on a track, but he's been a member of, you know, Electronic, The Cribs, Modest Mouse, the pretenders. I mean, he's just pretty much been like, Hey, can I join your band? And who's mm -hmm. ever going to say no to him? I mean, he's really <laughs> taken a really unorthodox path as well as, you know, released some great solo music or music with his band, the healers. But that's a very long way of me setting up the question is, do you think it was a sum of the parts situation? Like, you know, they've had their respectable paths, Morrissey and Mars since they've left and done good work, but like, 
the magic that they had together. So nothing that could ever like come close to that again. I, I'm laughing because you said some of the parts uh, and Morrissey <laughs> famously referred to Andy Rourke and Mike Joyce in the court deposition as replaceable as lawnmower. <gasps> parts, That's is, not nice, Morrissey. What a surprise. Nice. Like it's I said, nice. he would be well, so mean on Drag Race. My God. Morrissey being a bitch. I mean, what a shock. Uh, <laughs> And I disagree with that. And I think, mm, I, so do I. yeah, to go back to a question from a while ago is, you know, while the queen is dead is seen as the album, I got to stand up for strange ways. Here we come. Mm -hmm. I, th All right. I think pound for pound track for track. There's not a dud on that one. Whereas even on the queen is dead, you've got the long, never had no one ever. You've got, yeah, if they you're not cut that one out. Yeah, if you're not a fan of whimsy, you know, Vicar and a tutu can go. And even frankly, Mr. Shank. <laughs> nothing. There's like a lot that. of whimsy. There it the Queen of yeah. is kind of their Sergeant Pepper, isn't it? It's yeah. got a kind of nursery mm -hmm. rhymey songs to it, which right. is a good or bad thing, depending on your 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 tolerance for whimsy, as you say. But strange yes. ways, you know, the whole way through, it's like, well, I can't think of one to toss out here, where at least mm -hmm. on the head, you can think of one or two that could, you could lose. So I want to stand up for strange ways a little bit before we close because okay. I, do, I, I do love that. That is truly one of it. it uh, you know, it's hard to kill a baby there. Right. I mean, but that, that one is, it. Uh, you know, we had to sneak in, you know, uh, um, death of a disco dancer into the film. Like I was going, we had to, we had to like go off chronology. We've had some sticklers going, Oh, that album wasn't out yet when they broke up. It wouldn't come out. Like the timing is all wrong. Like it's a movie people. Would you really <laughs> want us not to have some strange ways in there? I mean, come on now. Yeah, you can take uh, some liberties, just like if you watch Rocket to. Man, you know what? Elton John did oh. not levitate at the Troubadour. Didn't exactly. happen that way. And you know, even though Morrissey says he was surprised and shocked by the breakup at the time, you listen to that album and it sounds like the end. It sounds mm -hmm. like it was recorded like this is it. Is even it their visitors? It's their visitors. Their <laughs> album visitors. Uh, they, they, uh, I, I kind of got the sense at least – Johnny knew this was it and it has that air of finality to it. So mm. a reunion, ah, no pass. No if pass. it happened though, would you go? Mm -hmm. You'd go. If it happened. Yeah. <laughs> so if, anyone, go. if, if yeah. apparently Coachella, I mean, obviously we're in a moment where Coachella is not happening, but like apparently Coachella has offered a millions of dollars more than once. But to wrap up with the question, I sort of asked in a super rambling way. What I'll ask it in a more succinct way. Now, what was the, the magic between Morrissey and Marr before the alliance was severed. Like, what was it that complemented each other? So, because they're super different in so many ways. That's it. There's just, it's, you know, opposites attract. They're like, it's a yin yang, it's a dark and light. I mean, they're just beautiful compliments because they did have a lot of uh, common ground. Like, they liked a lot of the same weird records and obscure stuff from the 50s and 60s. So, they had this great partnership built on a common love of a certain kind of music and then you know they were just emerged as very different and opposite people um and you needed that kind of balance i think to make this this thing work it was a, it, one of the great partnerships of you know songwriting partnerships of all time you've got your jagger richards your lena mccartney you got morrissey marr i mean there's so few that are that tight you know 100%. Perfect compliments. I What's would this? answer that with another question. Yep. Did mm. either of you ever get to see them live? I did. I did. Good. Queen all is Dead of, Tour. All yep. three of us all of them. Queen yes. is Dead <laughs> Music Hall in Cleveland. Yes. Uh, Universal Amphitheater, which is now the, uh, uh, I believe, a Harry Potter ride. So the site of oh, the no. problematic uh, Morrissey got replaced <laughs> by the problematic J.K. <laughs> Rowling. Oh, it was funny. a simpler time, 86. That live, that live show you saw, probably answers the question if you saw them live it was another level it was up mm. here because you know as as preening as morrissey was and as, as much of a focus and center of attention johnny marr was not a wallflower over to the mm -hmm. side oh you know, just kind of sitting back he was a guitar god and it was a band it was all it was all for them it really was i mean i i cannot i i dismissing and belittling the other two in the equation is ridiculous if you really listen to that music the drums alone are composed and hold up you know so much of that music um yeah uh an awesome live experience did you run on stage or try to 
I tried. I was at Great Woods in Mansfield. That's the live. If you get the new Queen is Dead reissue, they pressed a live a live show from that tour. That was the one I was at. I'm one of the little nutbags screaming his head off uh, in the crowd. Yeah, it was one of those things where we you ran over the seats to try to get close. And, you know, I'm sure people broke legs and fractured bones. And we got as close as we could. It was just a, a, a seething mass. And I remember almost nothing aside from like House in is now is the first one. At some point he waves his Queen is Dead sign around. Not and then we were me. then we were just limping back to the parking lot. It just was like a couple other random oh John, did you did you try to run on stage? Not at the Smiths. On Morrissey I did and succeeded. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> I was held back by the parents who were chaperoning us. And to this day, oh. I resent it <laughs> to this day. A couple other random questions I have. Did any of you become vegetarians because of Morsi? My best friend in high school did so much. She was uh, a dr just real random aside. She was a dressage person. She was like a competitive horse person. And I remember we went on a vacation once to Pismo Beach. And when we got to the hotel, she took out two framed photos to put on the nightstand next to our hotel bed. One was of Morsi and one was of her horse. <laughs> so she was an animal lover mm. and she became she full on became a vegetarian because of Morrissey. And I think a lot of like Gen X kids would say that that they stopped eating meat because he told them meat was murder. And he, you know, in I don't know if he ever did this in the Smiths concerts, but in his um solo mm. concert times he shows some pretty like disturbing, you know, animal abuse footage to like shock people into he won't even like have, you know, hot dogs sold at his shows, you know, he the smell of the meat, you know. Did any I guess I'll open up to a larger question did any of the things he espoused you know his politics vegetarianism celibacy whatever make you uh, adopt certain uh, lifestyle stuff like not eating meat hmm. I, I can't say it did in that degree i think it was more of a general like outlook on life uh definitely the Definitely the celibacy thing was like a bit of a get out of jail free card when you were pressed <laughs> occasionally just like, no, no. Oh no. But, um, no, that soon went out the window. Uh, once I started mm. college, um, no, it was more I think about like what they stood for in general. I always kind of put it to the band itself. Right. It was, again, it was like, that was our tribe. We had a certain ethic in the way we moved through the world with a lighter touch perhaps. Uh, and we kind of makes us a little bit of who we are today, you know, but I don't know. It, it, it's hard to put it on one band. I know some people are just, they tower over everything else, but I was really, I, I picked and from shows from, from all of it. I mean, Depeche Mode and The Cure have as much, and New Order have as much, you know, influence on the life choices or stylistic or intellectual pathways that I took is as much as the Smiths, I think. But there's other things <laughs> that we need to plug. How can people see Shoplifters of the World, Stephen? Anywhere you get your video on demand. Um, iTunes, Amazon. I hear there's this thing called Voodoo where you can acquire it. Mm. Uh, and I think any cable provider which is running uh, new releases, you know, it's just it's out there to rent and to buy if you want to watch it over and over and over again, which we encourage. Um, and, and I know some... Cinemas have opened up around the country. It's at the Quad in New York. I know I've heard, and uh, it's just check local listings. It's and out there. Twenty songs in this film, which is almost unprecedented. Twenty, 20 songs. Smith songs. We barely leave there. Twenty Smith songs. One Ozzy Osbourne song. One Bronski <laughs> beat song, and uh, we sneak in a little a, a certain ratio. Big Dipper has a tune, uh, and there's just some nutty library tracks and a good score. But yeah, it's 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 pretty great. Highly recommended. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Yes. Seal of approval. Well, I I give it my seal of approval as well. Get some uh, vegan popcorn. I guess that's <laughs> so like no butter on it and enjoy some vegetarian Warm. popcorn and enjoy it with your celibate date. <laughs> it's a very yeah, good like tofu dog and, you know, <laughs> you're a big juicy steak. <laughs> enjoy. Well, I che have che cheese puffs and, and some a Cabernet. There you go. However <laughs> you want to enjoy it is a highly recommended film. And I very much enjoyed this conversation, uh, guys. So thank you for your time. I am Lindsay Parker. I've been joined today by John Hughes and Stephen Kayak. We want to thank you for listening. Remember to give us a rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. And we'll catch you next time. 
was Totally 80s, the podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Totally 80s, and please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until our next episode, catch you on the flip side. <laughs>